question is uh, Jim McMillan, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Philly gun crisis uh, site and uh, how that came to be. And okay, thank you. Uh, hey, everybody. So my, my name is Jim McMillan. Um, I've got a whole bunch of notes. I'm going to do kind of a lightning talk, just because I, I have, have one prepared. Actually. But the uh, uh, first of all, I should introduce myself as the person. I'm, I'm the manager of the Center for Public Interest Journalism at Temple, which is the organization that's hosting this. But that's uh, that's not. Um, so Oh, yeah. well, it's not mine. Uh, but, but actually, the per actually we're partly funded by the person who does who funds a lot of uh, 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 nonprofit journalism in Philadelphia, and so in a sense, he helped make this happen by by, by providing my time. Um, but what you should know about CPIHA is we do a whole lot of uh, professional development. We sponsored 25 journalists from the Philadelphia region to attend the IRE conference. Um, we, 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 we had, we've had other panels here on, on solutions journalism, I don't know if people are still here, on, on data journalism, on journalism, uh, data security for journalists, uh, digital security for journalists, and so on. So, so, you know, follow us on Facebook, like us on like Facebook, follow us on Twitter and everything, or you can subscribe to the newsletter at the site. It's not very spammy. We've got sort of a 12-county, a three-state mandate, but we, we can stretch it a little bit, but, but it is a regional organization in terms of who we support. Um, Lion, in terms of Lion, I've been a secret admirer in relation to the project that I'm uh, about to talk about, so it's really great to see you. Um, I, I'm sorry that I've had to run back and forth so much. My, this is the worst, as I live here, it's the worst possible weekend for me. Last weekend or next weekend, and I've been here for every session, but over at IRE, I'm managing a party of 48 from Temple. We're involved in eight different panels, and this is nine coming, this, I guess, and, and, and that's the last thing I had to do. Um, but the, uh, and the other thing I, I just, I'm going to take two seconds to talk about because there's been a lot of interest. I launched a site I call Streamalism about Periscope and streaming video journalism that I think is the next big next turn in social media journalism. I did a, a presentation over at IRE on it. And, and that last post is from a pre my notes from a presentation I did at WHYY the other day. If you want to know more about that, let me know, but that's not why I'm here. I've been invited to talk about the gun crisis reporting project. Um, I, I, I launched and managed this. I, I launched this project with some a few partners, and we managed to keep it running for two and a half years until last fall at guncrisis.org. Um, we lost money, and I'll discuss how that. I'll, I'll discuss that problem and that journey um, before I'm done. Uh, on the bright side, we won awards. We had incredible publicity. We had local, national, and international attention. Um, and most importantly, I'm going to argue that we had real social impact. Um, but the. Uh, but first, but to put it in context, I should talk about um, my Philadelphia briefly. You've seen some of it if you're not here. But um, Center City Life is pretty wonderful. I only live a half a mile from here. You've seen the, the new fountains. That plaza opened over at City Hall just last fall, uh, just this spring. We've got a new bike sharing program. You might have seen that outside the Marriott if you've been over there. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, a new roller rink opened down on the waterfront with, with sort of a, 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 a carnival around it. There used to be an ice rink. There is, I guess, an ice rink there, but it's open. But, um, that's life for affluent Center City Philadelphia residents. It's very much a tale of two cities. And I'm going to scroll through some photos from the gun project. They're a little bit graphic, no worse than you'll see in a newspaper or wire service. Um, but, but, it, but if it upsets you, feel free to look away or step out of it. And I'll, I'll be through that in a couple of minutes. But um, I guess next I should talk and I should talk about the, I, I want to talk about the common media narrative. And full disclosure, I'm going to pick on Philly.com, but I worked for that company for 17 years. But I've been around Philadelphia for 24 years. I've got relationships with somebody in every newsroom, so I'm full of biases. But, but in this case, the um, here's their narrative. And, and, and the partners here in Harvard would be on that page if you scroll down from the recent Next Mirror Project uh, issue page on crime. Um, according to the recent, uh, I'm sorry, so crime fighting in the last few years appears on paper to be a success for Mayor Nutter. The number of major crimes has gone down for more than a decade, and it appears that the fine will continue. Almost every category, major, category of major crime is down. The number of homicides has declined. These are significant decreases. And that's accurate. That's absolutely true, but it's a little, it, it, it's, it's a little bit out of context. So here are some other facts in the meantime while I spoke through some photos. Just very close to 10,000 people have been shot to death in Philadelphia over the last 25 years. We have the highest rate of homicide per capita among the 15 largest American cities since 2006, and that's only how far back that I've gone, um, because you have to combine a, few, a couple of data sources to do that up. Um, the, oh, I, I should mention these photos are by my primary reporting partner in the project, jo, uh, Joe Casmerica, a Philadelphia photo journalist, um, which is, I, I used to be a daily news photographer, but I'll get back to me. Um, people in Philadelphia are four times as likely to be shot to death as New Yorkers. 
more people were shot to death in Philadelphia during the period of the Iraq War than the total number of U.S. military members killed by enemy forces in Iraq. More people have been shot to death by other people in Philadelphia than the total number of people killed by terrorists on September 11th. So you think about the national response to that, occupying two countries, long before in our history. This is one city. And, and the, the, I mean, of course, it's, the human suffering is the most important element, but, um, but for the benefit of everyone, the economic impact is in the billions. I've heard a, a deputy mayor say one billion annually. Uh, one of my interns, re, sort of late duty research, uh, indicated something closer to $3 billion, looking at Philadelphia data and the cost of violence from the American Public Health Association. This year, we've had nearly 100 homicides, more than 1,000 robberies with guns. This month, last month now, on Mother's Day, eight people were shot. On Memorial Day, nine people were shot. On our recent election day, 11 people were shot. So, so that fountain again. Um, that fountain has 245 jets. Um, I counted them on that kind of fanatic for a few reasons. But um, that's slightly lower than the number of people killed last year in Philadelphia. So in my mind, it's very much the homicide fund. Um, and, the, and the reporting, uh, generally, is just not very good. Um, it's lots of stenography, lots of official statements, very few questions about causes or solutions. Um, so meanwhile, in another part of town, um, I was a journalist turned uh, journalism professor. Um, and if some of you, I don't know if, it, if you recall, but I, I got a ton of publicity for early social media journalism five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and you know, everyone was writing about me, Neiman and Pointer and Wharton, especially about audience development and branding. And I had a lot of buzz, frankly. Um, but in my old career as a newspaper and wire service photographer, I covered important things. And people around me, people I love, people I respect were saying, hey, this is all really nice, but when are you going to do something important? When are you going to do something that makes a difference? So in early 2012, there was an outbreak, a, a, an unusual outbreak, even within those numbers of homicides in Philadelphia. And this led me to launch the gun crisis reporting project. I'll spare you some of the history. I initially planned to produce a documentary, and that's a whole other conversation. But, but there were so many people interested in participating in the site, I, I went down that path instead. Um, I just grabbed a few, uh, a few, few pages off, off my phone today. But for example, we covered crime scenes. We did some data. We covered community events. We looked at solutions. For a while, and this was un impossible to maintain forever, I had a solution. That's just a directory, a solution of the day post. If you go to the home page, there's a direct, the sort of static page now. I have, a, I call it the knowledge base, and it includes the solutions posts. Uh, we thought of it, I thought of it, um, as an independent, hyper-local, non-profit, solutions-oriented, trauma-informed, evidence-based, multimedia process journalism organization. Sure, we hit all the buzzwords, but I actually tried to focus on all of those things. But none more than being trauma-informed and solutions-oriented. That's how I differentiated our work from other people. We're trying to stop the killing. We didn't advocate for a particular solution. We looked at what worked and reported on that and wondered why things that were working were defunded and so on. The primary legs of the stool for me were journalism and psychological trauma, which I studied with the Dark Center at Columbia, and I taught a course on the topic of Temple. Um, peace journalism, which I studied while I was at Swarthmore and, and taught a course. And, and that that's a, that's aligns very well with, with the social, I'm sorry, the solutions journalism strategy that you, you heard about earlier. I had to leave, but uh, we've had Keith and the solutions team presented at Temple a couple of times. Um, and, and the catalyst for this was a, a conference, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of order. So I'm going to run through just really quickly scroll to this. The, uh, so what did we do? We did really affordable things. You know, we produced videos and, and posted them on YouTube. We covered memorials and, and conferences where they talked about solutions. Um, again, free tools, uh, mapping, mapping shootings on a, on a Google map. Um, using Google Drive to make you know buy uh, bars and pies. It, the bar is pretty low. I think it's it's pretty valuable content, uh, and it's pretty easy to do. Uh, so so that was all the shootings in, in, in one month, uh, color coded by medical condition. The red ones are fatalities. That was uh, comparing one one year with another, 2013, 2014, comparing the last uh, seven or eight years together um, for the first six months of that eight each year. This was an interesting one. There's a hot debate. Um, that comes and goes in this city and probably others about whether police should rush, rush shooting victims to the hospital or wait for the medics. The argument is whether they'll bleed while waiting or, or, or be endangered by being transported before they're stabilized. So I tried to compare the two, and it turned out what I discovered was that, where are the numbers? Um, so, pri private, uh, so, so police and, uh, I'm sorry, police and medics, that would be the choice. 
So police and medics only accounted for 45 and 17, 62 percent. About a third of the people were getting to the hospital on their own, either driving themselves, being driven by somebody else, a loved one, a witness, or taking the bus. I mean, it's a whole other aspect of the debate nobody talked about. Imagine that that means that just about every day somebody's turning up at a hospital alone. Is that a question? Um, so, so the. Um, so the catalyst for this conference from the, the dark center I had was holding over at WHYY in Philadelphia, where I learned about solutions. I worked in a newspaper, and everybody said, oh, it's a shame, something's got to be done. I worked in a newspaper before. And, but nobody talked about solutions. And I learned that there are public health interventions that lead to double-digit reductions year to year in every city where they're funded, and we generally don't do that. We weren't doing that in Philadelphia. Another thing that happened because we were reporting, and this was incredible. This was just a few months after launch were invited to come and lead round tables at Philadelphia City Council to talk about solutions. They were starving for solutions. Nobody was reporting on solutions. And, and this is where I think we had our impact, although I can't pretend it was strategic. I showed, uh, this cut off a little bit, but I showed the Cure Violence, which is at cureviolence.org, <laughs> a, a Chicago organization that's evidence-based that le leads to, uh, well, the, uh, it was replicated here. So, so after we, other people were advocating for this as well. But a after we advocated for this program, uh, the city funded or earmarked some federal money. Oh, I'm sorry. And that's a good look at how public health intervention works. A documentary called The Interrupters. It's on Frontline. Um, I'll post all the links and let you know right after. Um, and the city funded um, Philadelphia Ceasefire, which is the Cure Violence model. In the first year of Philadelphia ceasefire, in one, uh, they worked in one North Philadelphia district, the 22nd, with the most homicides, and, and homicides were reduced by 27%. Their budget was about a half million dollars a year. So when you think about the economic cost, it was incredibly cost effective. We also um, advocated for the work, uh, to, to look into the work of a criminologist named David Kennedy, who wrote this very important book. And, and eventually, they they launched a program that would be one, because there were variations for various cities, different cities, um, that led to a 50% reduction in homicides, a 50% reduction in gun deaths in South Philadelphia year to year. So this is where we had our impact. I'm not saying nobody else ever advocated for these things, but, but I think we moved the needle. And, and, and by, the, um, by the end of the, the second year, homicides were down 25% across Philadelphia. I'm not saying that we, we took, well, I'm not taking a lot of credit, credit. I think we moved the needle. I think we were catalysts, and I think journalists can do that. Um, so at, at, at a glance, that those are the monthly totals of, of homicides. Uh, yeah, monthly total of homicides, which are 80% gun kind of homicides, and that's basically our social media audience growing. So it's a, it's a very simple, an oversimplified graphic, but, but um, as we built a community, they, um, things got better. So, so what else do we do? The, um, so I'm, I should go back to my notes. So, so I, talk, I talk about the source and trauma, who we were, what we did. Okay, so over two and a half years, we covered every shooting incident. How am I doing on time? Two minutes uh, Every shooting incident in Philadelphia, if only a tweet or maybe sometimes in our, only in our data, but we produced 2,000 posts, published 4,000 photos, produced dozens of videos and maps and data visualizations. I guess that's, I meant to show the slides in that order. I, and remember, I'm a photographer. I wrote 400,000 words over two and a half years. Um, I, the, admittedly, there was some stenography in there, especially in photo captions. But, um, but the um, this, if you use WordPress, it's a WordPress plug plugin. You can search by author and see how much you wrote, and it was stunning. Uh, but we, more importantly, we built a community of thousands online, participated in a wide spectrum of community events. Sometimes just to learn, we walked the streets with ceasefire. We went into prisons with intervention teams. We went to funerals, um, and and, um, and, and I, I've talked about the solutions. Okay, so sustainability, right? Um, so I'm a journalist, I'm not a business person, and this is where I failed miserably. Um, awards and, publicities don't, and pu publicity don't pay the bills, obviously. It turns out, it was to my surprise, it, it doesn't seem to impress uh, funders. They want social impact. Now, we had impact by the time we had evidence of impact, and even that's kind of indirect. Let me talk about the impact for a second, too. Homicides went down by 25%, and quantifying the share of impact to the various forces is expensive beyond my means, beyond my expertise. Um, you're working on it in criminology at, 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 at a Department of Criminal Justice at Temple for that specific drop. Um, but you know, the only thing we know for sure is that everybody can't have all of the credit for the impact. Uh, journalists give it all to the police, and police cert certainly deserve some. When, when homicides are up, when things are bad, the, the message is we need all hands on deck, everybody's got to stand up and do something. And, and the journalistic narrative when, when crime goes down is our boys in blue are doing a great job. They may be doing a great job, but other, there are other forces 
and, and, and anyway, so back to funding. Um, <coughs> we got fiscal sponsorship from an organization called RHD, at RHD.org. Resources for Human Development is like a $200 million, 15 state social service nonprofit based in, in Philadelphia. Um, and they have an incubator they call New Beginnings. Um, the, uh, first we went chasing large grants, um, which was, would seem like a mistake, but we had a line on a large grant from, 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 from the get-go, and it had to do with the relationship uh, between uh, one of our supporters and, frankly, the biggest funder in the city. That was our big move. That didn't work. Um, the, the next, because we didn't have any, any, any history of, of business except for journalists, the next move, and, and, I, and the team's listed on the site too, but I don't know if that, but the, uh, then, then there was a new director of development at RHD. He suggested chasing small grants, stacking up the five and $10,000 grants, trying to make five this year into 10 next year, and, and, and getting multi-year commitments. I came to that too late, we were going broke by the time I did it. I, I was making three, four, I, I was exaggerating. I was making up to three presentations at small foundations and being invited to apply for a $5,000 grant. It wasn't cost effective, I could work it you know, the chilies and make make up money, <laughs> make the money in myself. Um, partnerships, um, I'm a little soured on this. Three significant news organizations came to us to discuss partnership. In their mind, they're the big dogs, they've got the sandbox, they wanted content for free, promised page views, but even when they were reporting on us, they weren't delivering a lot of page views. So I, I didn't go for those deals. I didn't like their tone. I didn't like the relationship. Sponsorships, a security company. Um, so think about like defense contractors, a large American security contractor came to us and said that they, they basically like us to report on their efforts, which might be coming to Philadelphia and another model, anyway. But, but they wanted all the control without really admitting to it. I was, I'm so eager to stop the killing that I was ready to say, okay, we'll work for you. Okay, buy us. Okay, we can do it this way or that way. And they said, no, we want you to report independently on the great things we're doing while we pay you. So that, that's ethically, <laughs> right. I mean, not in so many words, but almost. So, so that was ethically impossible. Well, and I offered every other alternative I could think of. Uh, we solicited donations. We used a service, uh, forgotten the name of, it cost too much. Um, we only raised less than $10,000 in donations from individuals over two and a half years. Interns brought their own funding. That's a, a funny formula. I'm on the record, but it's a little strange. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it. You can pay $40,000 to go to college or to send your kid to college, and if they're one of the best, they can apply for a program where they get paid $5,000 by the college to go volunteer for somebody else. So we had interns from Swarthmore, from Aberford, from, from uh, Temple, and we're very appreciative of that support. But, so what's funny is the interns were the only people who got paid. And, and that's not the worst thing that could happen, but it wasn't exactly our intention. <laughs> so when you look at our model overall, you could say we're all volunteers, we're all giving it away, and say we're suckers. Or you could argue that, that the organization, because a lot, I mean, who's really mopping up per hour in independent journalism anyway, but, but you could also argue that in, as an organization, that was leveraging any kind donate contributions of their service to our organization, including my own. So, so, and, and that would be in, the, I think, in a hundred thousand dollar range over two and a half years. So, that, I mean, that's a pretty rough estimate. Um, so, I, I, I know time is running short. I, I could talk about the status of Ben. Uh, I've uh, got a question for you. Let me see if I've done anything critical before right. I go. Um, now, and so I have a lot, uh, many more aspects I could talk about if you're interested. I just want to say I have to run off to another IRE commitment, but I'm going to come back for the last hour and could talk then. And the last thing I'm going to say is I'll, I'll post resources here, although they're not there yet. What should you have done differently? <laughs> it's so ridiculously obvious, and I heard the intros yesterday, and you're all, there are so many better business people here. But business first. It's as, as simple as that sounds. Journalists don't get it. There's also a mistake from being with all of the, at least a couple of our team members, three out of four at least, had been freelancers. And in the old news model, it's kind of we show what you could do, and then you got work. So we thought that would make sense here. It doesn't make sense. We show what we could do, and then donors would say, well, okay, now you can apply to do more, but they weren't going to fund what we were doing in the first place. In a nutshell, what I learned just last fall, although I applied a year ago, just last fall I spent a semester in what, Philadelphia, uh, what uh, they call the Philadelphia Social Innovations Lab. Uh, and so independent journalism, solutions-oriented independent journalism really might be synonymous with social innovations. Uh, it's run by the Fellow School of the University of Pennsylvania, and it's in a building by the clothespin just across the street there. But um, I learned about, about some kind of marrying um, uh, theories of change with, with uh, you know, a strategy to, f to fund and sustain it. And, you know, it's really not, I mean, it, it's hard work, the odds are against you, it's very competitive, 
but there are real, you know, crystal clear formulas, and I would have followed them if I had taken that workshop before, before I launched the project. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, so thank you. Thank <laughs> you.